Hi, I'm going to welcome everyone to the IWSB CAG meeting for June 2022. I'd like to welcome all participants and I'd like to recognize Tom Seidenson, the IWSB chair, Lynn Jewey, the deputy IWSB chair, and Galen Hansen, the IASBA CAG chair. Uh, thank you for coming to our meeting. I'd also like to note that our PIOB observer is Dave Sullivan. Welcome back, Dave. Happy to have you here. We have our official observers, Ms. Barbanich of PCOB and George Kaiway of the IMF. And we have other observers, of course, Don McGleachy uh, of the IFAC Small and Medium Practice Advisory Group. We also have some new members, and I'd like to welcome Sandy Peters from the CFA Institute, who is replacing Mohini Singh. I'd like to welcome Peter Stokoff of OECD, who is uh, replacing Inak Gazer. And I'd like to recognize John Riggs of IASCO, who is replacing Paul Munter. Welcome to your first CAG meeting and I hope you get a lot out of this. Uh, as is the case from time to time, we have representatives who cannot attend, and so we did receive uh, notification from them. And finally, I'd like to um, <clears throat> share a farewell. We have two people that are leaving, as I mentioned earlier, Inaka Yazer, who has represented OECD since September 2018. I, and Mr. Paul Munter, who has represented IASCO since March 2020. And I appreciate all the input they've had over the years and wish them well. And finally, I'd like to go to Tom Seidenson, the IWSB chair, to see if you, Tom, do you have any comments to, to kick off our meeting? No, I, I just really appreciate everyone's joining this call. Uh, we look forward to your input. Uh, and must be hope to finalize this exposure draft, which meets one of our top priorities, convergence with IASBA, um, next week. Thanks, Tom. And our first order of business is to um, approve the minutes. And these are the minutes for the IWSB CAG March 2021 public session, and that is agenda item A. I believe everyone has seen those minutes. Uh, so we are going to have those minutes approved. Any comments? All right. Um, and thank you for getting those minutes out to us. We appreciate that. Now, our highlight uh, for today is agenda item B, which is the listed and in public interest entity or PI conversation. We've had this conversation a fair amount in the CAG meeting, um, but uh, the reality is it's coming up uh, in the June 2022, so I guess that is next week actually, where the uh, PI task force will present to the IWSB for approval the exposure draft uh, for proposed men amendments to ISA 700 and ISA 260 to address circumstances when the auditor's report is used to disclose that all relevant requirements for independence for certain entities have been applied, such as public interest entities in the IASBA code. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have Josephine Jackson return to the CAG a very familiar face who's going to talk to us about the um, exposure draft. Josephine, I will send it off to you. Right, well, um, thank you, uh, Jim, for the introduction and, of course, the invitation to attend this CAG session. It's always a pleasure. And as Tom has already mentioned, we do appreciate the CAG taking time out of their very busy schedules to input to the work of the IWSB. I do want to take the chance to remind CAG members of the staff and task force assigned to this project. We have uh, Natalie and Kalina who are watching closely, I think, keeping me on the straight and narrow. And of course, working hard in the background, coordinating with IASB staff. 
And on the task force, we have Sung Nam Kim from IESPA, and we have Fernando Len, who is also with us today, and Chum Wee. And thanks, as always, to uh, Jeff and Ken from IESPA for their ongoing support. So if we can move on then to the next slide. Thank you, Michelle. There we go, perfect. So the agenda items that you have in your pack include the report back document, which is agenda B, which gives you a flavor of the advice from the CAG at the last session, and of course the board feedback. Uh, presentation of course is available B1. And then the exposure draft, which is B2. And then at the end of the session, I will actually give you an idea of our next steps. And it is, of course, important to add that IWSB haven't had a chance to discuss this final uh, exposure draft yet, although both CAG and IWSB, as Jim already mentioned, have seen earlier iterations of our proposals. So this meeting does give us a good opportunity to discuss any final matters and the hope to receive final approval for the ED from the board next week. So moving swiftly on to the next slide. So just a little reminder of the key decisions that the IWSB made at the March meeting. Now, the focus of that meeting was, of course, first to seek approval of the narrow scope maintenance project. And of course, the board did approve that project. And then we set forth some initial options regarding the auditor reporting requirements to obtain the IWSB's views on their preferred approach, which I will, of course, cover today. And um, as IESPA were also meeting the same week, we were also able to agree a way forward on a matter that was raised at our IWSB meeting in relation to the applicability of the new independence requirements in relation to review engagements. And uh, I'll talk through that as today as well. So next slide, please, Michelle, thank you. So on the reporting requirements, I'm aware that we did discuss this with CAG in March, but I thought it might be useful for you to have a quick reminder um, of what we discussed at that time. Now, for all of the different options we were putting, uh, putting forward, those differential requirements for specific entities are essentially required. So option one included a requirement for the auditor to actually disclose that fact even if the disclosure was not a requirement in the relevant ethical requirements. And then option two, of course, tied more closely to IESBA that the auditor would only disclose this information if the relevant ethical requirements required disclosure of that information. And then option three didn't in fact include any requirements at all, but instead application material was proposed that would alert the auditor to the fact that disclosure might be required and if so, the application material would also give an example of how the auditor might achieve that. So with those were the, the options that we discussed with both CAG and IWSB in March. So next slide, please, Michelle. So where did we land? Well, you'll recall, of course, that option three, which is that third bullet point, was discouraged by CAG and overall the board agreed with that view that option three would not be appropriate. So that's been disregarded. And then there were different views, both from CAG and IWSB's perspective, which of option two or option one were most preferable. So the IWSB did um, have to put forth one option in an exposure draft because the exposure draft covers the proposed changes to the standards. So in the end, it was agreed that actually option two would be the more appropriate option to set out in the exposure draft. However, at the time, it was agreed that for context, certainly for our stakeholders, we would explain in our explanatory memorandum that option one was discussed. It was an alternative that the board considered. And uh, particularly as there were board members and, of course, CAG members who favoured that option, but also to explain why that option was not pursued as far as the exposure draft uh, was concerned. So the actual explanatory memorandum will ask respondents, first of all, whether they actually agree that the auditor's report is the appropriate mechanism to enhance transparency about relevant ethical requirements being applied. And um, if not, it will ask what other mechanisms should be used to publicly disclose when a firm has actually applied the independence for pies. And the emphasis as well in the explanatory memorandum is on that context of public disclosure, 
And then, of course, how IESPA should deal with such mechanisms, given that the IWSB doesn't actually have any other mechanisms within its remit for public disclosure. And we did talk a lot about this at March meeting as well. And then the other matter I mentioned was that um, we did discuss review engagements and part 4A of the code actually applies to both audit and review engagements. And therefore revisions to the eyes of the code regarding listed entity and PI, including the disclosure requirement also apply to review engagements. But when proposing revisions to the IESPA code, the focus of the discussion for both boards was, in fact, on enhancing the auditor's assertion about relevant ethical requirements and not the reviewer's assertion in a review engagement. So the focus was on the audit. And so it was agreed with both IWSB and IESPA at that time, hence the fantastic coordination at the March meeting, that this would actually remain the focus of the IWSB. B's ED, so audit. But it certainly would be worthwhile to take that opportunity in explanatory memorandum to ask respondents whether they believed a revision to 2400 should also be required to address the IESPA disclosure requirement. And so what we have done, we've explained this in the explanatory memorandum, and we've also set out an example in the explanatory memorandum how that might be achieved and that will just help stakeholders, um, it will give them more context and help them visualize how this might play out as well. I will note, however, that we don't intend to amend 2410. I mean, you will recall from other discussions on other standards that as a result, this standard is, um, well, not as a result, but this standard is still in pre-clarity format and it's not been subject to any conforming amendments over the years. Uh, but it is, however, included in our research as a possible uh, future project. And so anything that may happen down the line will happen in accordance with any project to revise 2410. And we've also um, explained that in the explanatory memorandum as well. So there we are. So uh, next slide, please. So in um, developing the explanatory memorandum and the exposure draft, so in addition to what I've already mentioned, that's the alternative approach to amending 700, the impact on review engagement and the actual proposed requirements. We've also discussed the public interest issues that we believe we have addressed, and I'm going to cover that in the next slide. Thank you, Michelle. I'm hurtling through. Apologies. Um, so in this section, um, we, we have to recall that, of course, IESBA's ED also have public interest matters that were relevant to their proposals regarding the transparency requirement. So our focus in RD, RED is on the importance of the IWSB's interaction with IESBA and, of course, alignment with the code as far as possible. And that's very much one of our key objectives in our project proposal. Uh, we've also set out in the explanatory memorandum why the auditor's report may be the most appropriate mechanism. And you will, of course, be familiar with these points when we talked about the options in March. But just as a reminder, uh, when the relevant re ethical requirements include transparency requirements, then the requirement in ISO 700 will allow for greater consistency and comparability globally when reporting this information. And then it also provides clarity to auditors on how they might disclose their assertions about relevant ethical requirements that they have applied. And of course, the auditor's report is accessible to users of financial statements, which also means it meets the requirements of a mechanism for public disclosure. If we move on to the next slide. So these next few slides cover the proposals in the exposure draft. So it's a little bit of uh, rolling up the sleeves and getting into the technical stuff here, but it's, it's not too tricky. So the first change proposed is an extension to an existing requirement in ISO 700. And it's a conditional element that explains why the, that the ethical requirements may require public disclosure, but these differential requirements have been applied. And then if that condition exists, then the requirement goes further to explain how the auditor does that. And it explains that the auditor shall indicate that they are independent of the entity in accordance with those independence requirements. And you will see that on page four of agenda B2. So that's the exposure draft. And then if we move on to the next slide. <clears throat> 
And uh, I did mention, of course, IWSB opted for option two in the end. So the assertion is made by the auditor only if the relevant ethical requirements require that transparency. And this was the board's preferred approach because it does not put an obligation on the auditor if their relevant ethical requirements do not require that assertion to be made in the auditor's report or, or a public uh, disclosure to be made. And it also doesn't arrive, override any jurisdictional decisions about transparency. For example, it may be possible that policymakers decided that such a specific assertion was unnecessary. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Lovely. And then we have additional guidance in the application material, which you'll see on page five of B1. And you will see that we've added A35A in the exposure draft. And this application material explains that relevant ethical requirements may require the auditor to apply differential requirements, audits of financial statements of certain entities. And in addition, consistent with the ISBA code, it explains the auditor may determine that such independence requirements should be applied even if the entity is not in scope. So those of you closer to the ethics standards there, you'll recall that 419A encourages firms to consider whether to treat other entities as pies and list factors to consider in making this determination. And the board thought it was important to explain that this could be the case, so voluntary disclosure or voluntary application in, in certain circumstances. And so that's now included in the application material. And then the application material also explains that the auditor may be required to publicly disclose that it has applied differential requirements. And then it goes on to offer an illustrative disclosure of what you would see in the basis for opinion paragraph. And it uses the ISBA code as an ongoing example. So that you'll see again, as I say, on page five of B1. Then if we move on to the next slide, Given that it is possible that the auditor applies the ISBA code and local relevant ethical requirements, both of which may require differential requirements for PIES, and of course, disclosure of that fact, we have included a proposed amendment to illustration one in ISA 700 that shows the basis of opinion in those circumstances where, again, where both apply, and you'll find that on page seven of the exposure draft. So perfect. So. If we could move to the uh, next slide. Thank you. So um, the board continued to support the view that when the auditors apply differential independence requirements, that this is imp important information that should be communicated or that may wish to be communicated with those charge of governance as part of the auditors existing responsibilities to communicate information about relevant ethical requirements. Now, um, there aren't any necessary changes to the requirements here, but it does result in proposed application material that highlights, similar to what we see in ISA 700, that the auditor may communicate that differential requirements were applied and that this information is required to be disclosed in the auditor's report. So um, as we have set out in our proposed application material on page nine of the exposure draft, we've, we've basically align that as far as possible in the context of a, the communication standard with the description of the circumstances that I've already talked through in terms of ISA 700. So it's, it is very similar application material. It talks about the fact that differential independence requirements may be applied in certain circumstances and public disclosure may be needed of that fact. We move on to the next slide. So just to confirm that very little before I talk about the effective date, you can tell really by just the way we're, we're flying through these slides and I'm not purposely flying through them. There, there isn't really a great deal um, in the exposure draft um, to address this transparency issue and, and actually very little change to the auditor's report as well. So that may be comforting to some. So in, the, in respect to the effective date, you'll recall that this part of the narrow scope amendments project was put on a fast track and that was in order to align the effective date with that of the ISBA code. So it will it be in effect for all of financial statements for periods beginning on or after December 15th, 2024. And it's the view of the board that assuming the proposals are supported by our stakeholders, this is more than sufficient time to actually implement the proposals 
particularly as I just mentioned, the wording is very tightly aligned with existing requirements in ISA 700 and ISA 260, and there is very little change. And of course, the main work effort in terms of implementation is, of course, the adoption of the amendments to the code. We move on to the next slide. So, as I mentioned, it was thought important for context to explain the alternative option to our stakeholders, and I have explained some of these points already, but to clarify, whilst this would certainly lead to greater consistency in auditors' reports globally, it does actually disregard or potentially disregards any choices that jurisdictional policymakers may have made as to whether the disclosure of this information in the auditor's report is necessary. It could expand the disclosure requirements to entities that are not PIs. And of course, the scope of this project is to focus on the IESBA conforming and the IESBA amendments. And it could, of course, lead to complex explanations when you have multiple ethical codes, which can be the case in some jurisdictions. If we move on to the next slide. And of course, this one uh, summarizes the points I've already made on review engagements and that we will, of course, be seeking stakeholder views on the potential inclusion of conditional requirements in 2400. So we could probably move along, Michelle, because I've covered this already. So coordination, as before, we have continued our close coordination with our IESPA colleagues. And as a mirror to the IESPA project, we now have a member of the IESPA board on our task force, who I've already mentioned, and that's Sung Nam King. And Sung Nam is a member of the IESPA PI rollout working group, which of course was established back in March. So you'll already be aware of that. And we will continue to discuss our side of the project at the relevant plen plenary sessions, of course, with CAG also, and, um, and Jeff and staff will also continue to coordinate in the background as always. Um, so next slide. Actually, Jim, before I get to the question, I'm going to do the next slide first, if I can. Often I find that um, if we could move to the next slide, Michelle, and then we'll go, I often find that sometimes the questions are about the the way forward. So I thought I'd cover that first. So the immediate next steps, as you know, are aimed to approve the exposure draft in, in June, so the June meeting next week. And um, respondents will be given about 90 days because these really are small targeted proposals, as you will have seen. And then hopefully um, all things going well, we should be able to issue any final pronouncements by June 2023. But meanwhile, we will also be working on other aspects of our project proposals. So we'll be developing the objective and guidelines for differential requirements and examining whether our existing differential requirements that are for listed entities should be extended to PIs. And this is, of course, track two. Um, assuming that some amendments are made to existing differential requirements, we are aiming for an ED around September 2023 with a final pronouncement a year later. And uh, depending on the feedback that we receive from our respondents in respect to our question around review engagement, so 2400, that would also form part of any track two work that we do. So that's that will be our next steps, as it were. So, Michelle, if we could pop back to the previous slide. And um, so, Jim, I, um, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. And really, this is our last chance to provide you with feedback since it's going to the board uh, next week. And But this is a, a good opportunity for, for everyone to provide that feedback. I already have a hand up. And Dave, I see you have your hand up. I, I do, Jim. Thanks very much. And Josephine, thanks for the presentation. I have a quick question. I'll save any public interest comments till the end of the discussion. Um, but, but before my question, Tom, I wanna to congratulate you on your reappointment as chairman of the IAASB. I think that's fantastic. And I know you've got a lot of work ahead of you, so um, keep up the good work, but uh, congratulations on that news. Um, Josephine, the, I thought the, the summary that you, that you prepared and the exposure draft were really easy to understand that I wanna congratulate you on the quick work that was done. On slide 12 in the presentation and in the exposure draft, I, I noticed this was around the communication with those charged with governance. It says that the auditor may communicate 
the, the, that the differential independence requirements were applied. And I just wondered why the, with respect to those charged with governance, wouldn't we always want them to, to communicate the independence requirements that were applied since that's so foundational to the value of the audit? Just wondered. Thank you, Dave. Other questions from our point of view from the CAG? Well, everyone is, there we go. Greg Rethman, welcome. Good morning, thank you. And thank you, Josephine, for the, uh, the overview. Um, I, I had a question concerning the language used in the draft proposed wording of the auditor's report. And I am relatively confident that this would be the first time the word public interest entity is used in the content of the audit report. Um, and being with a public sector perspective and the continued uh, potential confusion of public interest and public sector and you know, is public sector not always in the public interest. I wondered if there was scope for defining the term in the audit report, similar to what we might do with respect to a group audit when we introduce the concept of a group audit and then we, we explain who's involved in the engagement and that they represent the group if we then continue to use the term group throughout the audit report. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Hilda, welcome. Uh, good morning or good afternoon for me. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a comment and a question, so I hope I can already go to uh, a comment as well on the proposals that have been uh, made. Uh, and as far as what is proposed, and because we looked at, at the slides, uh, what is proposed on uh, slide uh, eight, I think overall, uh, from our perspective, we would, uh, you know, support uh, that way uh, forward, basically going to option uh, two. Um, and when we think about this from the point of view of the European Union, uh, we already for public interest entities have some requirements to actually uh, be more specific about uh, some independence requirements than uh, just an overall uh, description because we do not only have to say we are independent, we also have uh, to indicate that we have not provided uh, prohibited non-audit services. And in addition, if the company uh, has not disclosed which allowed services were provided, we also have to uh, disclose that. So this can become potentially quite a lengthy disclosure already in the audit report because that's all to be disclosed publicly. And it is therefore good that you have uh, this example uh, that you disclosed, uh, that you discussed on, on page or slide 11. Um, we were just wondering, and that's the question then from a, um, a, a practical point of view, if you have, uh, because of jurisdictional requirements, uh, already quite some lengthy disclosures on independence, um, and if that's the most restrictive, the most demanding ones, even if you have followed the AISPA one, is there some kind of a prioritization or if there's some kind of, uh, you know, a, a way that uh, you would consider uh, could be uh, the best way to approach this, to, to avoid confusion, because referring to uh, a code, referring to European legislation, potentially even referring to national legislation might become, well, lengthy and potentially confusing for the reader. So we, we were wondering, have has the task force thought about this? Is this something that you would think you would uh, address? Thank you. Thank you, Hilda. Way, welcome. Oh, thanks, James. Hello to everyone. Uh, thanks, Joseph, for the update and explanation of background information of the board's decision. And as I expressed in March meeting, my preference is option one. And my view is based on the need for users of auditors' reports to understand 
whether an entity has been treated as a PI and the auditor is subject to the relevant ethical requirements for PI engagements. Without such disclosure, it may lead to confusion that all entities are treated the same and auditors are subject to the same set of requirements. I respect RAASB's due process to arrive at option two to be presented in ED and the support explaining in the EM that option one was an alternative approach, which may facilitate the formulation of comments on the ED. I would also like to support the encouragement in the application material that voluntary disclosure when there is no such requirement in RERS. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Wei. Akihito, welcome. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, I have two comments. Uh, the first point is regarding uh, alternative approach considered. Uh, from the uh, perspective of more transparency, uh, to, to disclose the situation in order to clarify uh, whether the relevant ethical requirements for PI audit is applied uh, would be better. So the uh, alternative approach is better for me, but uh, this is included in this exposure draft as another option to be considered. So it is uh, supportive for me. Uh, the second point is regarding uh, revision of uh, ISA 260 for communication with TCWZ. Uh, in view of the importance of uh, communication about the compliance with independence requirements, uh, I think that uh, it may be necessary to add this uh, as a requirement uh, rather than application material in PI audit. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Akihito. We have a few more. Josephine, do you want me to, to continue on or? Shall I, shall I like deal with the, Yeah, I can pick up a few as and then pick up the others. Um, thank you okay. uh, for those, those questions uh, already. Really appreciate that. Um, in terms of um, the point that was raised about um, whether we need to consider um, an explanation or definition of PI. It, it, I would imagine in most jurisdictions that's already set out anyway in laws and regulations, so it'll probably be a known term. And from that perspective, it's the same as um, our approach to listed entities, it's a known term. But in terms of um, a definition of the term, we're going to look at that, um, Greg, as part of our track two. Um, we don't feel that it's necessary at this stage because we don't know what those differential or those specific entities are at this stage. So it may not be PI in a jurisdiction. It might be, for example, large public entities or uh, large private entities, for example. And, um, and so it's not just necessarily PIs that we're dealing with here. We could be dealing with other types of entities where public disclosure is required of the application of those differential requirements. So, so for the purpose of this exposure draft, it isn't necessary to define it, but we'll certainly take that on board and think about that when we're looking at um, the definition for PI in, in track two. So appreciate that. Um, and then it was, the other comment was from Dave and from Akito in terms of the communication to those charge of governance. I, I do appreciate that. There is, um, there is a slight peculiarity in ISO 260 um, that there is a requirement to actually uh, communicate that the firm has complied with relevant ethical requirements and is independent already in the requirements. One would have, have thought in, <laughs> implicitly when uh, the auditors have that conversation or make that report to those charge of governance, they do express the relevant ethical requirements that they have applied. And then we have the um, other peculiarity that in our application material, we, we do use the word may. So I appreciate that um, this is something that you would rather have considered as an explicit requirement, but I do feel that you get there anyway, because the auditor already has to communicate that they're independent in accordance with relevant ethical requirements. And all the application material is trying to achieve here is a reminder that in fact, some of those may be differential. And in fact, 
the auditor also needs to make this disclosure in the audit report, which is not necessarily implicit from what we have in our standards already. And then um, Hilda, from the practical perspective, we are aware that in you know that national um, national or local standards may require quite significant additional information in an auditor's report that goes above and beyond uh, what's required by the international auditing standards. You take, for example, in our own jurisdiction in the UK, there's quite significant um, additional requirements around fraud, going concern, and as you say, around ethical requirements as well. Um, from a practical perspective, the only thing we can do is go back to um, ISO 700, where it talks about clarity in the information that's being reported, and, um, and hope that there is um, that the auditors, when they're actually putting in all this information, they do break it up in, in a form. But it's certainly not really something we can deal with in our actual requirements, because in many jurisdictions, there won't be any additional requirements. So from that perspective, it's just being aware of it. And um, I was thinking I shouldn't really say this. Lily will probably be annoyed with me, but I was thinking it might be something we might want to think about as part of our audit reporting um, post-implementation project. And if there's some guidance that we could potentially put out in terms of one of our FAQs in thinking about that and thinking about making sure it's clear and understandable when you do have this not conflicting, but multiple layers of reporting because of additional national requirements. And uh, so, so something we can think about. And Vili's not smiling, so maybe he is slightly annoyed. <laughs> and, um, and Akito and Wei and Wei Ming, thank you so much. Um, I do understand and appreciate that your preference was for option one. Um, but hopefully setting out the alternative in the exposure draft does actually give stakeholders some insight to, to the, certainly the conversations we've been having and some of the reasons why we decided that in the end option two was probably the most appropriate in the circumstances. The key reason, of course, from my own perspective is that jurisdiction policymakers may have specifically decided that disclosure was not necessary and that would put the auditor in a little bit of a tricky situation. And I do believe that's um, all the comments that were raised so far, Billy. Uh, sorry, Jim. Thank you, Josephine. We do have a, a number of other comments, so I'm going to continue on. Heisen, welcome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Josephine, for the presentation, for the clarification of this uh, really important issue. We uh, are... Uh, seen the material, and we think that the option uh, two is uh, that one that uh, will provide for uh, transparency, even considering different uh, uh, requirements, and different uh, jurisdictions. So, this kind of uh, reporting uh, it is uh, conditioned by the requirement of uh, relevant ethical requirements. And uh, this would be helpful. So we uh, support uh, this uh, option and the uh, IWASB uh, position on this uh, uh, issue. So it's just uh, supporting and we have uh, other comments. Thank you. Thank you, Heisen. Peter, welcome. Welcome to CAG. Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Stokhoff. It's a privilege and a pleasure to represent the OECD at this, my first meeting of the CAG. I have an observation, if I may, on one of the documents with a section entitled Stakeholders Impacted and five broad stakeholder groups, one of which is the profession. It reads all auditors and assurance providers and other professional accountants who apply the standards. Now, auditors can be external and they can be internal, both provide assurance. And I guess saying, and other professional accountants implies, may imply that all auditors are accountants. So I was wondering if um, we in fact meant the external audit profession. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Conchita, 
Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Reference to the discussion in March on the same subject. Uh, we welcome the choice of option two because we said then that one and two may be considered and that having some explanation on option one may be a good reference point, but uh, uh, adopting option two is uh, preferred. So we support that. And uh, with respect to the two tracks, uh, we support that too. Thank you. Thank you, Conchita. Klaus, welcome. Thanks, Jim. Uh, just to say that uh, when we discussed this at the CAG in March, I supported option two. So I would just to express my support also for a proposal as it's drafted here. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Asha? Welcome. Asha, you may be on mute. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Hello. Right. Uh, sorry, I can't uh, switch on my camera because uh, we are experiencing power cuts at the moment. So uh, I missed some of the presentation, but uh, thank you, Josephine, for your clear presentation. I am also uh, of the view that considering option two as the preferred option in the exposure draft is, uh, is also what I also would agree. Uh, one more thing I want uh, just to share one more thing on the effective date. Uh, just want to share the process in our jurisdiction, uh, the process of the standard setters, like uh, generally the auditing standards when the, uh, the effective date is generally the same as the effective date of the international auditing standards. But uh, we are kind of uh, behind the application of the code. So in fact, currently we are still applying the 2018 code. So uh, just uh, like, I don't know how practical it will be for us to, uh, to the, the effective date of the code and the uh, auditing standard also to be of the same date. So it's just a thought that I want to share with you. Thank you, Asha. And I believe those are all the, the points we have. Uh, Josephine, I just wanted to add uh, just a couple of thoughts from, from my point of view. And, and one is in the area of transparency, we can always use trans, no one's going to say transparency is not a good thing. And in looking at what has been proposed here, I think it is good to be transparent, but I, I think maybe the IWSB board needs to consider uh, the audit report and, and, and what should, should and shouldn't be in, because if you, if you take it to a larger extent, you could end up with a multi-page report. And from time to time, we, the, the report comes unwieldy and they end up slimming it down. So I, I just think uh, transparency and communication of the report need to be considered by the IWSB. And that doesn't really relate to this one because I, I support it. And then second comment, I think really uh, was just a general comment is when I read the, the ED or the proposed ED, I did have to read it a couple times to read through it just to, to make sure I understand where it landed. And so that is different than some of the other CAG members who, who were able to, to get through it much quicker, but I, you might wanna just take a look at that um, from a simplicity point of view. And with that, I will give it back to you, Josephine, for, for your, your feedback from the comments. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thanks to those who have commented on, on the option that we're putting forward in the exposure draft and support for uh, the, uh, the alternative as being uh, context. Um, I sure appreciate that uh, there will always be jurisdictions that um, need to do a little bit more work to implement standards and, um, and meet effective dates. So that's, that's certainly something we are, are aware of, of course. 
Um, Jim, to your point about transparency, obviously in this case, a good thing. I mean, I always, always occasionally have to remember this is the only form that the auditor has to communicate to the users. And, um, and therefore, it is, as I say, because it's their only form and inevitably when it's in a public interest to communicate certain information, it will go through to the auditor's report. But in the context of all the other projects that we're doing where there could be an impact on the auditor's report, we have to look at those individually and those subject matters individually as what's important and in the public interest and, and, then, and then stand back from that and think about to your very point could this be simplified so it's more understandable and um and not confusing to users so certainly we we do have that in mind and we have had that caution before and certainly from the CAG as well and um in terms of your comment thank you on the um exposure draft I'm assuming at this point you mean the um explanatory memorandum piece we'll certainly take that into consideration and um I'm sure if you have that point of view others will certainly have that point of view as well and think about how we could perhaps streamline some of that so really appreciate that feedback that's really important thank you and then Peter in terms of the uh, stakeholder groupings that's obviously um, not determined by us it's determined by the monitoring group I personally think when we talk about the profession we're talking about public accountants in business we're talking about auditors internal auditors but before I say the wrong thing, I just <laughs> double check with Vili um, that 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 my understanding is right. Thank you, Vili. Yeah, um, um, that's correct, uh, Josephine. Thank you, uh, Peter. So you're quite right in the monitoring group um, paper um, in the public interest framework section of the paper. It's uh, those five groups of reference, and it's reference in the context of that when we set standards, these are the broad stakeholder groups that have a legitimate interest in the standards that we set. So I think you're quite right where it refers to all auditors um, and, and assurance providers that is meant to be very broadly um, a, a broad reference. Um, similarly, when you talk about professional accountants, that could be professional accountants in business or professional accountants in practice. I think in the context of this particular project, remember this is a narrow scope project, we are simply trying to operationalize the requirement that has been put into the ethics code. And that requirement specifically appears in a section of the code that applies to um, 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 auditors of financial statements. And well, and, and to the point that Josephine made um, previously, um, it would also apply to review engagement. So in that, that context, it certainly refers to external auditors. Thank you, Josephine. Thanks, Billy. And um, that's it, Jim. I believe I've picked up all the comments, uh, unless there are any more. Thanks to uh, everybody and uh, all your input. And we'll take a, a number of these things away as well and address them. But really appreciate that. Good to see well, thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, well, I guess our comments will be very fresh since you're meeting with the, the IWSB board next week. So. We uh, look forward to seeing those, those comments considered. And uh, we will continue on with our meeting. I, I wanted to see, this was the last uh, technical subject area. So Dave, uh, from a PIOB perspective, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, thanks, Jim. I, you know, I was just gonna say <laughs> to what I had said before, um, I think that the exposure draft addresses the public interest issues that were raised in previous meetings, including convergence with IESPA and the transparency of the, of the auditor's compliance in the auditor's report. And, uh, and would just again encourage in the, during the feedback gathering stage that, um, that there's outreach to other stakeholders other than auditors, when I say other stakeholders, including investors and users uh, of financial information to make sure that this is meeting their objectives as well. And that was it. Thanks, Jim. Great, thank you, Dave. And Tom, do you have any final remarks? Other than, other than thank you for your input. Um, it will be helpful to us as we go to finalization next week. Thank you, Tom. And we have one other item on the, the agenda, and, and that's the, the upcoming
CAG meeting, the, the IASBA CAG will meet on September 6, and the IWSB CAG will meet on the 7th and, and the 8th. Now, I know in the last meeting we had a fair amount of discussion whether the meeting would be held virtually or in person, um, but I don't think this is the meeting to meet in person. And, and part of the reason for that is the IASBA uh, board is meeting in a different state and the logistics between the, the two meetings at the same time as the CAG meeting um, make it very difficult uh, since a number of members are both on the IASBA CAG as well as the IWSB CAG and, and just the logistics don't really work out very well. So I, I don't think this is the right meeting for our re-entry. Uh, I know I, I'm a little disappointed that we don't have a chance to get together in person. I also recognize that it is a challenge for a number of, of my colleagues on the CAG because of timing. I mean, it, the, the time zones make it very difficult for attendance. So I have asked um, the, um, the IWSB staff to, when we, when we set our next CAG meeting, we'll be very cognizant of the time zones and do our best to accommodate everyone on that. And it is my hope that in March that we will be able to get together in person and, uh, and, and finally uh, see each other on, on that basis. But I did want you to know a little bit about what was behind uh, why we're unable to meet um, in person this September and will be virtual. So with that, I wanna to thank the public observers to listening to the meeting. And I'd like to close the public session uh, for today's meeting. So Michelle, can you stop the streaming of YouTube?